Thank you, Scott, for for taking the time to uh, prepare those remarks. It's very, very kind of you, and I really appreciate it. I, I do love spam. We we eat fried spam and rice at home periodically, and I like mine with brown gravy on it. I know. <laughs> I, I should point out that Barack Obama likes spam too. So I'm not the only person uh, ever to eat it. Now. I also have a comment about, it is the same Joel Klein, who was chief of the antitrust division of the U.S. Department of Justice. And a funny story is that uh, uh, Joel, after Mayor Bloomberg took office in uh, January of 2002 as mayor of New York City, he appointed Joel Klein to be the chancellor of the New York City schools. And the Gates Foundation had been involved for many years in New York City and uh, in helping out. And very much to the credit of the, Ga the Gates Foundation, it's my, I wasn't present at this ceremony, but as I understand it, there was a ceremony at which a new grant was announced and that Mr. Gates was there on the podium with Chancellor Klein and announced this major new grant. Uh, it was something like $40 million. Or, it was a big number. And in the middle of the ceremony, a voice shouted out from the audience, Hey, Joel, imagine how big that check might have been if you hadn't prosecuted them. <laughs> so I guess everybody's able to keep things in a larger perspective. As Scott has said, my first study of schools, and I, if you can't see the screen, don't worry about it, because I'm going to use it primarily as a prompt for myself, and I will relate to you everything that's up there, so don't, just don't worry about what's on the screen, please. The uh, <clears throat> first study had the aim of determining whether a decentralized school district in which principals are given substantial decision-making authority at their schools would be associated with higher performance by students as measured on standardized tests. At the time I did that first study, which began in the year 2000, there were only three school districts in North America that were decentralized. And those were Edmonton, Canada, the pioneer that had begun this in 1973 and is still going strong today with principals controlling about 94% of their school budgets now. It's actually increased a little bit in the last two or three years. <clears throat> Seattle, where John Stanford, then superintendent, had gone north with his new chief financial officer, Joseph Olszewski, and they had spent half a day with Mike Strombitsky. And the idea was a very simple one and a very appealing one. And they brought that idea back to Seattle Public Schools and implemented it. And the third was Houston, which had started its own version of decentralization early in the 1990s. And then they heard about Edmonton and they sent, according to them, teams and teams of people to Edmonton. So Edmonton is the innovator. The Edmonton approach subsequently traveled to New Zealand, to Australia, to Great Britain, and it is now the way they manage all publicly funded schools in Great Britain throughout the nation. There were only those three, so I studied them and I compared them to the three biggest traditionally organized districts New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago? And the answer was yes. Clearly, over a period of years, the decentralized districts, if you compare them before and after they decentralized, and if you compare them <clears throat> to like students in the centralized districts, centralization is associated with higher student performance. I can't tell you I proved it. I can't tell you I disposed of the issue forever. Only a, a fool would make such a claim. There are many flaws in the design. The sample was too small, but it was the universe. It was all of them. However, I was convinced. I had, my intellectual curiosity had been satisfied. I was sure that I knew that it was true. 
Now the next question was, okay, what is it that principals do differently when you give them this freedom that accounts for the higher student achievement? So I designed the new study, which is my topic for today. As Scott said, we visited some 440 some odd schools, or we randomly sampled. But now there were eight districts, and indeed I was, I should disclose, a, an unpaid pro bono consultant on an occasional basis, it's not like I was there all the time, to Chancellor Joel Klein in New York City. Uh, you, you, probably that has clouded my objectivity to some degree, but I disclose that to you and you can decide for yourselves uh, by just how much I may have been uh, biased as a result. The secret of TSL is, I don't know if my editor is going to let me actually use that title on the book or not, you know, book titles are marketing, they're not scholarship. So I write the book but the publisher gets to decide what the title is and I learned long ago not to sweat it. Just let them do their thing and don't get anxious about it. They can call it whatever they want, I don't really care. Uh, I got to write what goes between the covers. But probably most of you have never heard the term TSL. But let me tell you that we did a, a huge complicated statistical analysis of these 440 some odd schools and of the eight districts. So it's a two stage least squares kind of analysis for those of you who care about such things, which is probably nobody in this room, including me. And uh, we, we looked at every kind of educational reform these districts had tried in the last five or six years from new math curricula to new reading curricula <clears throat> to new teacher training programs to block scheduling to uh, incentive systems to all kinds of things and we looked at TSL and among all these variables the only thing that had an effect on student performance was TSL total student load what is TSL think of it as the number of papers that a teacher has to grade so maybe you've all heard of Bronx High School of Science in New York City. There are three selective admissions schools that are academic and one for the arts in New York. The three academic schools are Bronx Science, Peter Stuyvesant, and Brooklyn Tech. Approximately 24,000 eighth graders sit for an entrance exam in New York City every year and of those, roughly 4,000 are offered admission to one of those three high schools. So Bronx has some of the most highly motivated, best prepared, brightest students in New York City. And the contract with the teachers union calls for up to 34 students per class in high school. And every teacher, basically everywhere in America, teaches five classes. So a teacher, if they assign a paper, has to read five times 34 papers, 170 papers. Now ask any teacher, if you were to assign a paper that's intended to prepare a senior high school student for college, that would probably be a research paper of some sort with a length of 10 or more pages. I mean, when I was in high school, my senior paper was about 80 pages. But I know nobody does that anymore. But let's just say 10 pages or more. And then ask that teacher, how are you going to read 170 10 or 15 page papers and write thoughtful commentary on each one on the logical development of the argument, the use of evidence, paragraph development, sentence structure, proper use of simile, metaphor, and analogy, notation style, presentation of tables, proper citations, spelling, punctuation, and so on and so forth, and you know it just isn't going to happen. And the result is that students at Bronx Science, the best students in New York City, each semester write two short papers and one long paper. Now you might think that's not so bad, but what do you think the definition of a short paper is? Well, what's the standard all across America in high school? It's a five paragraph paper. A five paragraph paper. At Bronx Science it means two page paper. And they write one long paper 
per semester. What do you think the definition of a long paper is? Three to five pages. In the LAUSD, it's often said, I can't prove this, that nobody reads written student work anymore. The teacher checks off whether each assignment is hand, handed in, but never reads any written work. So if your child hands in every assignment, they get an A. The parent sees a series of A's and thinks everything's fine until that child takes the PSAT and they discover far too late that everything is not fine. 